Good morning. So we're in a series on things God never said. Last week we talked about God wants you happy, and this week we're going to talk about um, something that I've heard said quite a few times, and that's God will not give you more than you can bear. Now, I, I've heard it said in life, you're either going into a storm or you're coming out of a storm. There doesn't seem to be much in between oftentimes. And it's, it's amazing to me, though, that when we're in the middle of the storms and when we're in the middle of the struggles and the trials and everything else that goes on in life, we often find ourselves thinking this is more than we can bear. And, and here's the thing, when, when we're going through struggles, when we're going through trials, we hear a lot of well-meaning led advice. You know, how many of you guys have ever heard the, the idea that when, when, one, when God closes a door, another one, uh, he opens a window? Anyone ever heard that? Well, my question is to that, what if the window was on the seventh story? <laughs> I'm not jumping, Okay. That's all I'm saying. Or, or God only helps those who help themselves. Now, that's something where I'm writing about, and you guys will be able to see that in this Wednesday's um, news, newsletter. But, but that's, that's got problems in itself. And then finally, the well-meaning thing that I have heard is like, you know, somebody's going through this hard time, and they're, strugg- and they're talking with somebody in their struggles, and they say these kind words. Well, you know the Bible says God will not give you more than you can bear. And unfortunately, that's not true. And also, I believe when we say words like that to somebody, we may be meaning well, but the biggest issue and problem with this is that it can cause so much damage. When we misquote and misrepresent scripture, we can cause damage. So we have to be careful with the things that we say, especially when we think we're speaking the Bible, but we're not. Actually, that um, verse comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, where it says, No temptation, let me repeat that, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful, he will not let you be what? tempted. It's not, I'm not going to give you more than you can bear. It says, I will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. That's not what this sermon is about, but I'm going to offer some advice, okay? Sometimes the way out that God provides is to, you see that door back there? Is to take it. Or sometimes the temptation that you may be dealing with is sometimes better just to throw it in the trash. Okay, I'm sorry, but there's a lot of temptations and things out there. That's sometimes your way out. Don't let me forget that there, okay? (laughs) I'll get in trouble. But anyway, um, but yeah, so it's important to realize that it's talking about temptation, not about the different troubles and trials that are going to come in our lives that are going to be oftentimes more than we can bear. He's talking about temptation, not about what we think he's been saying. Does that make sense? So anyway, but I want us to also understand that God, God often uses people who cannot help themselves. And here are some examples in the Bible. We have Gideon, who was the weakest in his clan. He was the least of his entire family. And, and not only that, uh, he also says, God, I need you to prove that you're actually calling me to this. So we test him with the blanket and all kinds of other things. And yet God uses Gideon to help save the people of Israel. And then we have Moses, um, who was a slow speaker. He was a bad communicator. And he says, I can't do this. Pick somebody else. And what does God do? God gives him Aaron. And then what does Moses do? He goes and he leads the people out of Egypt. And they get to wander around the wilderness for 40 years and 40 nights. For 40 years. And and he also gives them frosted flakes, a.k.a. manna, um, and, and meat. It's great. 
Um, and then we have Esther. She was so afraid to go up and speak to the king um, to go and save the people because at that time it was if the, if the pharaoh, I mean not the pharaoh, if, um, if Xerxes doesn't hand her the scepter, she is dead. And yet what does she do? She goes and she speaks on behalf of the people of Israel. And then we have David, who's at the end of his ropes as he's dealing with the, the weight of his sin and his struggle and his problems. And he says this in Psalms 38, verses 4 and 8. He says, my guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. I am feeble and utterly crushed. I groan in anguish of the heart. See, David... Even in the middle of his sin, he realizes that this is too much for me. I have failed. I am down and out. And yet God was not done with David. And then we have Jesus in uh, Mark 14 before he's going to the cross. And he's, and he's praying to God and saying, Lord, if there's any way, take this cup from me. But he says, not my will, but your will be done. And he goes to the cross, and because of his death on the cross, we have life. See, God never said he would never give you more than you can handle. Now, there's two reasons why I think God gives us more, allows us to experience more than we can handle. Number one, it's to depend on his presence. I, I want you to, I, I don't know if any of y'all have ever experienced this, but when things are going really well, it's easy to forget God. I mean, whenever I'm getting a promotion, um, I, I'm, I'm all of a sudden getting a big, if you're getting a big raise, you know, you're going from like pennies to now you're, you're able to eat McDonald's and caviar and stuff. That's pretty good, right? When your kids are doing well, your, your child is an all-American, um, your, your job's doing well, your faith is going well, everything just seems to be going great in your life. It's easy to forget God. Now the opposite can be true when things are going bad. Brian and I were talking yesterday and, and we were talking about that, you know, sometimes you have fair weather Christians. They, they treat God like a genie in a bottle that we put on the shelf when things are going bad. So we just grab that genie and we say, Lord, please help me. I'm in trouble. Please, please save me. I can't do this. Um, things are going wrong in my marriage. Things are going wrong in my family. Things are going wrong in my kids and everything else. But when things are good, they're gone. You don't even see them. And so sometimes we use God as we get three wishes and we need to make sure that they're all good. We see them when things are in trouble. I need you to pray for me. I need you to pray for me. Please pray for me. And it's like, we'll pray for you, but where have you been? Where have you been? We're, you're worshiping God when you're in the most trouble of your life, but when things are going good, we don't even, you don't even remember who we are. And it reminds me of an example of, in the people of Judges. In the book of Judges, it's a great, it's a great um, consistent pattern. When things are going good, I don't know who Yahweh is, Who's Yahweh again? I don't know. Um, but when things are going bad, oh yeah, don't you remember we have a God? And then God, what does he do? He comes in and saves the people, and then the cycle repeats. Oftentimes, if we're not careful, that can be the weight of what our faith is. When things are good, we don't know God, but when things are bad, Lord, I need you, please. See, and then the other thing is, is, and sometimes we have people where God calls us to things and we rebel against God. See, Jonah, for instance, he rebelled against God. Jonah knew that he had this call to go and preach to Nineveh, that God was going to destroy Nineveh. And he says, no, I'm not going to do it. I refuse. So what does he do? He runs from God. He gets on a boat to try and get away from God. Then all of a sudden the waves and the storms are crashing. And then they realize that Jonah is running away from God. And he says, I'm running away from God. So what do they do? They throw him overboard. And then he gets eaten from a, in a, by a whale or a fish, whatever you want to call him. And this is what he says while he's stuck in the belly of the fish. In Jonah chapter 2, verses 2 and 7, it says, In my distress... 
I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realms of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. And what's fascinating about all of this whole story is Jonah goes to Nineveh anyway. He doesn't get the outcome that he wanted. But it's in that moment that God is able to teach Jonah. But I find it fascinating that that Jonah says it's in my, what is it? Distress. In my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. It's not in my success. I called to the Lord and he answered me. No, it's in my distress because I believe it's in the valleys of our lives, in the pits, in the bellies of the fishes of life where we truly grow closer and understand the presence of God in our lives. I can tell you my relationship with God has always grown stronger when I'm in the valley than when I'm on the mountaintops. But sometimes we can get into this habit of saying, Well, because I'm dealing with hard times, because I'm dealing with struggles, because I'm dealing with all this, because God won't give me more than I can bear, we then use that to say that God does not exist. So do not allow the presence of a storm in your life to cause you to doubt the presence of God in your life. God will allow us to face more than we can bear so that we can learn to depend on him in all things, in all situations of our lives. And second, it's, it's to experience God's supernatural power in your life. There's a story I heard where is this, they, apparently people used to take road trips back in the day. I don't know if they still do that with gas prices being so high. But, but apparently um, one parenting mechanism I learned was that this dad was on a road trip and he had his, um, his son in the back and he said, son, I bet you cannot hold on to this handkerchief outside of the window the entire trip. And now, if any of you guys ever met a guy, there's something in us that says when somebody bets we can't do something, there's just something innate that comes inside of it that says, oh yes, I can. I mean, that has led me to do many things. Um, The joke used to be my final last words were going to be, hey guys, watch this. Um, I'll show you. So anyway, so the story is, is the son is out there. He's got the handkerchief for two and a half hours. He's just holding on to it. The wind, you know, the resistance and everything is going. And he gets, and they finally get to, their, to his grandma's house, I believe. And he gets out of the car and he says, Dad, I held on to the handkerchief the entire time. His arms are sore. He's sore. He's in pain. He's, in, he's tired because of all the wind resistance and everything else. And the dad's like, oh, you showed me. And the, and the amazing thing, apparently, is that the kid never said a word. So um, the dad knew what he was talking about. But I make this story, I, I tell this story, because that's us. When we believe the lie that God will not give us more than we can bear, we're like the child who's holding the handkerchief out there. We're trying to deal with the struggles of our life. We're dealing with problems, maybe in our marriage, in our, fa- in our families, in our friendship circles, in our jobs, and whatever else it may be. And we're doing our best to hold on and be strong because God's not going to give us more than we can bear. When we believe in that lie, and what's going on is we're tired, and we're exhausted, and we're wondering what's going on, and we're thinking that maybe, just maybe, we're almost through it, or whatever else it may be, and yet maybe Maybe it's important for us to understand that we are not meant to stand on our own strength. We're not meant to stand on our own will. God did not create us to be um, all, all by ourselves. God created us to work with one another and to rely on God. How many of you guys remember the series we did last year in the story? In the story, what was the whole point? God kept letting the people go because what happened is they thought they could do it by themselves. And what does God do? He allowed them to go into exile. He allowed them to go into hardships. He allowed them to spend time in the pit. Why? So that they could learn to point towards God instead of pointing towards themselves and everybody else. We are not meant to stand on our own strength. 
Because we were made to be created to need God. We were made to need him, to trust God, to hope in God, to believe in God, to trust in him in all the situations, and to know that he is going to come through. We are not made to do this on our own. Maybe God gives us more, allows us to experience more than we can handle, more than we can bear to realize the supernatural power of God in our lives, to get us through moments that we didn't think were possible. And I think the other reason that he allows us to give us more than we can handle, and this is a freebie, is so that we cannot say, I did it. We can't point the finger and say, we did it. No, it's so that we can point to God without a shadow of a doubt. And sometimes that is our greatest witness to those who are lost. And even Paul, in all of his wisdom, said he realized there were things that he could not do on his own. If you turn with me over to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we're going to be looking at verses 7 through 12, just for a moment. Second Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 7, it says this, Or because of these surprising, surpar- surpassingly great revela- revelations, therefore in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was giving a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness, therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. See, Paul had struggles that were more than he could bear, just like many of us. He had a, he had a thorn in the flesh just like many of us. And he pleaded with God, just like you have probably pleaded with God with the thorns of your life, and you pleaded with God to take it away from you. And yet maybe God didn't take it away. Paul's was so he wouldn't become conceited. So that he could realize that it was Christ who was in charge. Christ said it was so that he can understand that his grace is enough. And church, I think the message is also clear for us. That God's grace is enough for you. Because what Paul realized that in his weakness, he is strong because of Christ. In his valleys, he realized that Christ was enough. In his hardships, in his pain, in his persecution, in his almost being killed and left at the city gates nearly dead from being stoned nearly to death. He realized that Christ is enough. That when he is weak, Christ is strong. He is strong because of Christ and what Christ has done. And so the beautiful message for all of us here who are um, holding on to the lie that you've got to hold on to it, that God will not give you more than you can bear, is this. You don't have to have it all together. That's great news, church. You don't have to be perfect. Actually, Christ calls us to be broken. Because only He can build us back up. This place is a hospital. It's not a, it's not a, um, a seminar where we pretend we have it all together and we're acting like everything is hunky-dory all the time. That's not what this is. Because troubles will come in this life. We will experience death. We will experience death that will just rock us to our core. I had a friend who passed away a few years ago. She was about 24 years old. 
she lost her battle with stage 4 cancer. And I remember sitting there with her husband. And he's dealing with all of this struggle and all of this pain and all of this loss. And I, I'll be honest, that was one of the few times where I said, God, I'm going to check out for a second. Because we prayed, we hoped, we prayed some more. We had prayer community gatherings and praying that God would not take her from us. And yet she still passed away. That doesn't mean that death is going to happen. And, and I remember um, people talking to her husband and saying, Well, it's going to be okay. You'll find another wife. It's going to be all right. You know what? We shouldn't even put, her la- um, put your last name on her tombstone. Don't worry. God's not going to give you more than you can bear. There's going to be hard times and struggles and troubles. And I do believe the most insensitive thing that we can do at times, and if you've ever said this or you sometimes use this, I plead with you to stop. Stop telling people God's not going to give you more than you can bear. Because that is sometimes the worst thing that we can ever say to somebody in the middle of the worst day of their life. So he'll allow us to deal with things that, that will be death. We'll have problems with children in the future. We'll have problems with debt, job loss, and the list goes on and on and on. There in this world, you will have trouble. In this world, you will um, experience things that are more than you can bear. So we need to stop saying that you have to be strong. And we need to start telling one another, no, you don't have to be strong. No, you need to be weak. It's in our weakness that, that we are strong. It's in our weakness that we can boast about all the things that God has done. Because when we are weak, He is strong. And I th- also believe that when we are weak and we realize that we're nothing without God, we come to this understanding. Until God is all that you have, you'll never realize that He's all you've ever needed. I'll repeat that just in case some of you were sleeping. Until God is all that you have, you will never realize that He is all that you've ever needed. Church, I think there are so many moments in our lives where we have to hit the bottom of the bottom to realize that we need to turn to God. But not just should we turn to God and treat God like a genie in a bottle. No, we should treat God in our highs, in our lows, in our pits, wherever it may be. We need to go down to our knees and realize that we can do nothing without God. Because until we realize that God is all we have, we will never realize He's all that we've ever needed. God will allow us to experience more than we can bear so that we can depend on his presence and for some of you to experience his supernatural power in your life. Because God works in our weakness. God works in every moment of our lives. And so you don't have to have it all together. So this week, whatever you are holding on to, I I pray that you will give it to God and let Him carry your burden. So for some of you today, maybe you realize you've reached the end of your ropes. And you're you're realizing this is more than I can bear, this is more than I can handle, this is more than I have got a grip on. And maybe you're, you felt this calling that maybe you should come to church today. Maybe you should come and try and have a relationship with God. Maybe you're trying something new for the first time today and that's praying. And maybe you're saying, I don't know God, but I want to know God because I've tried everything else. I've tried doing it on my own will, on my own power, and my own strength, and I've done a really good job messing it up. 
And so you, maybe you Googled Las Cruz, churches in Las Cruces and you found that we're the second or third hit on the, on the Google and you're here today and you're just wondering, is there something more to this? Is there something I can do? Well, today you can do that. We would love for you to come in and realize that you have sinned, that you're a sinner, that you're broken and you're lost and you need Jesus. And so today you can step into a renewed, a new relationship with Jesus Christ. You can step into walking alongside one another and loving one another in the waters of baptism for the forgiveness of your sins. And then for some of you, maybe you've believed the lie your whole life that God will not give you more than you can bear. And maybe you're here today and you're thinking to yourself, this is more than I can bear. This struggle, this pain, this whatever it may be that you're holding on to, maybe you're realizing this is more than you can bear. And maybe you want prayers from the congregation, and we would love to do that for you today. We would love to surround you and pray over you and walk alongside one of you and try and help to hold you accountable. Because we were never meant to do this on your own. But what I want to do before we close out is I want to pray for everybody. Let's pray. Father... I pray for those in this room who have been living under the lie that God's not going to give you more than you can bear. That you won't give, you more than, give us more than you can bear. God, I, when, I, when I hear that, I, I just realize that this goes against the entire message of the Bible. Because God, the only thing we know, we know the only thing that you've ever wanted is for us to have a relationship and a strong relationship with you. Not only in the valleys, but on the mountaintops. And so Father, I want to pray right now for those in this room who are dealing with this struggle, who are holding on to things. And God, I just pray right now that you put it in their heart to let it go and to give it to you. And God, I I pray for those who might be in here who are visiting or tuning in online, who are thinking and they're watching this and they're they're asking themselves, maybe I should come and accept you, God. And God, I pray that you give them the courage to come forward, to give them the courage to realize that they need to be baptized into you. God, I just pray for revival, Lord. Lord. Sometimes that's a scary word we don't say. But God, this is what, that's what this country needs, Lord. We need to stop thinking that it's all about us and start realizing it's all about you. And God, you make us strong in our weaknesses. And so, Father, I pray for those who need you, God. I pray for those in our city and in our country and our state who need to have a relationship with you, God. And God, we're so grateful for everything you did on the cross for us. That you willingly came and died so that we could have a relationship with you. Thank you for Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. And everybody said...